Good afternoon and welcome uh, to uh, uh, the Midday Gordon Center event. And we have uh, a guest in from Europe who is uh, for first fellow be in New York, affiliated with Columbia University, uh, the Harriman Institute. And it's a historian whose interests are very close to my own. Um, my own interests uh, going back some decades now. Uh, so it's no coincidence we're both here at the same time. Uh, Anna Safronova, who is visiting us from Paris right now, uh, and is completing a dissertation on the history of the cooperative movement in Russia. And um, uh, and unlike, for instance, my own work, she's trying to she's doing both the imperial period and the Soviet period, which gives a perspective which is very different from what we're used to, and, and I think very interesting and very promising for that reason. Um, so um, she's going to give more information about her own biography uh, in a way that she would like it presented uh, in terms of you know, academic training uh, and how exactly she's going about her work right now. And then she's going to launch into the, to the lecture itself, uh, which is an overview of the project. Is that right? Uh, actually, I, I'm drawing only one part of uh, chapter six and seven because the whole project would be like too, 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 much? Too, too, too much. Okay, so you're letting us ask lots of questions about the rest of it. Yes, yes. Goes and and saying, but didn't you do this? And you say, yes, it's in the other chapter. Exactly. Right. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So I have the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you. And thank you for having me. So uh, a short bio before uh, starting. Uh, I was born in uh, Volsky, Rogovich region. And then I uh, moved to Moscow. I don't know why I've chosen Portuguese. And uh, there were no a lot of future with Portuguese language in Moscow at that time. And I followed my passion uh, vocation and I chosen to study uh, history thanks to the French uh, Collège Université Français. And then I uh, came to Paris to continue my research and uh, I was accepted to Paris Panthéon-Sorbonne University uh, under the supervi supervision of Madame uh, Marie Perret at Panthéon University. And uh, for now, I have already finished with uh, the writing of my dissertation and uh, it is due to be defended sometime in the beginning of October. So I'm very happy to present uh, the the whole result of my uh, research. And uh, as I already told, the, the present talk uh, draws only from a small part of my broader uh, research on cooperatives. So uh, when, when I was speaking on uh, my topic, uh, I have faced two types of uh, reactions. On the Russian, people were saying, oh, you're working on uh, the cooperatives during the NAP and this liberal enterprise that was finally destroyed by the Bolsheviks in the 30s. And when I was talking on cooperatives in France, people were reacting, oh, you're working on the agricultural sector and kolkhoz and collectivization maybe, and Chayanov. And uh, actually, there are two different uh, branches in historiography. The one is uh, mostly interested in agriculture branch of cooperative uh, general movement, and the other one on the urban uh, one. And uh, actually, these two uh, phenomena are so dif different. But my problem was, why are they uh, bearing the same name of the cooperative. And uh, in order to face this ambiguity and polysemy of the cooperatives, I decided to make a synthesis of all the uh, different, different branches and heterogeneous uh, parts of the cooperative movement that politically is very diverse. From its very beginning in the, be uh, in the 1861 as a result of uh, emancipation reforms and liberal reforms started by Alexander II until the uh, collectivization uh, and the great turn and the ban of the commercial trade in uh, 1930. So uh, this is my, my general uh, topic. And today I, uh, I will mostly talk on the way the Bolsheviks had transformed the something that they inherited after the October Revolution. And uh, just before uh, starting 
my presentation, let's just uh, define what is a cooperative, finally. And uh, the definition that I have uh, come along with, uh, there are two parts of uh, Parts of the definition. First, cooperatives as institutions, and second, cooperatives as a part of a cooperative movement that uh, agglomerates uh, several people. So, first, as institutions, cooperatives are a kind of uh, enterprise that is owned formally, that is owned and managed by its users, that can be uh, normal agricultural producers uh, <laughs> or uh, normal just citizens. And uh, in a formal way, uh, the, the power is uh, the power belongs to the general assembly and the executive boards. And uh, there are three types of uh, institutions that distinguish that are distinguished uh, by the sector of economy they are active in. So, consumer cooperatives that allow retail trade, uh, agriculture cooperatives that allow buy uh, to, that allow agriculture producers to buy agriculture inputs and uh, sell the commercialize the, their produce. And finally, a, a marginalized part of cooperatives are uh, worker associations that also allow to buy raw materials and resell the, um, the final produce. And that is for the uh, institution. And as for the cooperative movement, I distinguish two types of actors. The first one are the supervisors and these famous preeminent figures, ideologists, theoreticians, that people that were mostly studied uh, by uh, my colleagues in their works. And uh, just these people that uh, write works on cooperatives, that promote cooperatives, and uh, also um, most uh, generally uh, white collar workers that work uh, in the umbrella organization that coordinate the functioning of uh, local uh, bottom co cooperatives. And the second group of actors are these common ordinary members of cooperatives that remain very uh, anonymous in, in general way. But several, uh, some of them can become uh, members of an executive board and uh, entering uh, uh, in communication with the supervisory uh, part of the actors. And uh, in my thesis, I also studied the professional groups, uh, the professional group of instructors of cooperatives whose job is precisely to make the interface between these two types of actors. So uh, we see that there are two types of actors and they have uh, interests that are quite diverse and uh, the ideology of uh, cooperation is quite uh, uh, well studied. So, if you want, we can return to the uh, to it in more detail in the Q and A session. But uh, now, just uh, when we have this uh, definition and uh, of the cooperative ide ideology and something that is quite uh, big. Uh, normally, uh, the, the, the dominant narrative that exists presents this uh, cooperative movement as uh, a victim of Bolshevik regime that had uh, has been destroyed in the frontal confrontation after the October Revolution. And uh, it is true that there was a frontal confrontation, but uh, if we only pay attention on the leaders, we can actually miss uh, the rich uh, variety of strategies that different types of actors deploy in reaction to the uh, Bolshevik power. So uh, now we come to the key question of, of this uh, talk. So uh, my key question is to, rather to uh, look at the confrontation, uh, to pay attention more on the adaptation and start different strategies that uh, on, the other, on one side the cooperative actors deploy and the other side the Bolshevik deploy to remaining power, to survive and uh, in different contexts, uh, 
after uh, the Bolsheviks came to power during the first 10 years of uh, new Bolshevik rule. And uh, I always, uh, also want to address the way how these different strategies of adaptation have transformed the nature of the cooperatives and the way uh, the ordinary people were living their uh, experience in, as a cooperative members. And I argue that uh, if we uh, rather uh, consider this relationship between Bolsheviks and the cooperative uh, leaders and movement, not only as a confrontation, but as a diverse uh, complex of uh, strategies of adaptation, accommodation, and uh, uh, improvisation uh, from the both sides, we can better understand uh, the nature of cooperative movement and the nature of Soviet power itself. And I claim that uh, the Bolsheviks have instrumentalized the cooperative uh, institutions, not because they were fundamentally against it, but because the cooperatives uh, as institutions were very flexible and uh, diverse and versatile, uh, sorry for this French uh, small accent. So it was possible to turn the, the, the cooperative institution in a way so it could serve the new cause of a new political regime. And it was this instrumentalization to a new political cause was possible because the pre-revolutionary ideology was no longer attractive to the uh, common uh, members of the cooperatives since uh, starting from the October already. So uh, when the, so when the Bolshevik came to power, cooperatives uh, as ideology had already almost no support from the popular uh, classes. And uh, as we see, the cooperative movement actually is a loser of the February Revolution. But uh, if we see, uh, if we look through the dominant narrative on the cooperatives, on the contrary, we get an impression that they were very successful. And in the first place, uh, it is true that uh, the number of cooperatives grow in a spectacular way. You can see in the graphics that uh, the, the number of cooperatives have been growing, and especially since the First World War began. But uh, does this mean that the new cooperatives that were created were uh, really subscribing to the ideology? It is not sure. So uh, this argument does not uh, confirm the, the, the success of the cooperatives as ideology. Uh, and on the map, you can see uh, that the cooperatives, uh, agricultural and co consumer cooperatives were already uh, distributed, not in a very even way before, but after the provision crisis caused by the First World War, uh, cooperatives were created literally in all villages and every village. So it was a, a very present phenomena everywhere. And uh, second, we can also think, we can also have an impression that cooperatives as a movement, as a political movement was successful uh, after the February revolution. And it is true that we can see that there were people uh, from the cooperative movement that were taking part in the provisionary government. But when we look in more detail, we can see that it is only the last month of the provisional government in the third coalition uh, composed in September. So it is the less uh, important co co uh, government composition and uh, we can also see that the, the political allies of cooperative leaders are mostly social revolutionary members. And here in the photo, you can see a picture of a, one of the congresses of cooperative uh, leaders in the beginning, in March 17. And in the chair, in the honorable, honorable places, you can, can see Sergei Prokopovich, 
what is uh, who is uh, actually is an economist but one of the uh, central figures of the consumer cooperative branch of uh, cooperation and by his side there is a social revolution there is a uh, Babushka of the revolution, Ekaterina Bereshkova-Rishkovka, that actually has nothing to do with cooperatives uh, in a strict way, but she's invited as an honorable member. So we can uh, see that this success is misleading, and uh, the ideology of cooperatives was really uh, marginalized, and we know that this part of socialist movement has terribly uh, lost the, the political battle. But even if we uh, forget the political field uh, between different socialist parties, uh, we should question if this ideology was really uh, attractive to the common members. And uh, we can see, uh, and uh, many archival uh, evidence shows, that since the beginning of the war, the gap between the supervisory personnel of cooperatives, as well in a more general way of the urban elite, this gap between urban and the rural population was growing in a very uh, impressive way. So uh, since the war began, the ordinary members were no more eager to dissimulate their uh, disdain of supervisory personnel that were coming to them, and there are cases of verbal violence against supervisory personnel that come to supervise uh, cooperative. And there is uh, another political group that uh, had managed to attract the frustration and uh, had made out of uh, political elements uh, of popular classes uh, its own political program and the Bolshevik have uh, managed to get this frustration to their side and as we see i uh, i have put this poem by <clears throat> Dimian Bedney that was written after uh, uh, one of the members of executive board of uh, central Sayyid had said uh, in September uh, 17 that workers should uh, learn to, to, to live in the worst conditions till the victory end. Uh, and uh, actually, this, um, this uh, replic of him has shown the, the social distance that existed between the cooperative leaders and the ordinary uh, members. And th this distance was instrumentalized by uh, Bolshevik, and uh, here you have a poem by uh, one of his, uh, I, I mean, one of the official poems by Dimya Bedny. When the, the Bolshevik came to power, uh, in the first place, they had no specific urgency to, to, to do whatever with cooperatives, but their real urge was to resolve the provision uh, crisis. And uh, I should uh, say the uh, Bolshevik party makes, uh, actually it sits in a larger uh, current of orthodox uh, social democratic parties as uh, German uh, social democratic party too. And uh, in their vision, the cooperation, the corporate cooperation is only useful in cities so the social democrats only usually consider consumer cooperatives as a tool for trade in the in the cities, as a tool of controlling uh, of uh, uh, the way the, 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 the commerce goes. And the agricultural cooperatives are not really their uh, point of interest, and they just remain in the shadow of their view because uh, they, uh, the social democrat program towards the uh, villages is that one of collectivism and not of cooperation. But uh, when Bolshevik came to power, they had this idea that consumer cooperatives could be used as a tool to uh, control the, 
the whole retail trade. And the centers are used uh, leaders, those that we have seen on the pictures too. They were uh, mostly uh, convergent on this point. And except for a handful of most preeminent leaders that were connected to different political parties, the uh, vast majority of uh, supervisory personnel, especially in the branch of consumer cooperatives, they had uh, accepted to work with Bolsheviks and they were actually very happy that uh, consumer cooperatives could be a monopolist in uh, the sector of uh, retail trade. And uh, this was actually uh, an example of a mutual adaptation of both of uh, consumer uh, branch movement and Bolsheviks. And uh, only because of civil war, the, the things didn't go as uh, smoothly as they could. So the violence was growing quite fast and uh, uh, the, the first negotiation became uh, impossible and but, but quite soon Bolshevik just uh, had to uh, pass the decrees that uh, make uh, cooperative subaltern uh, totally to the Soviet uh, system. So the institutional autonomy of co cooperatives were, was suppressed by uh, a decree of 20 March 19. And uh, later, the same sort was uh, that of the agricultural cooperatives. So during the Civil War, there was almost no cooperatives, and uh, they only reappear during the NEP. And uh, here, uh, the, 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 the devastation of civil war, riots, and famine had uh, forced the Bolshevik Party to rethink their agricultural program and their attitude towards the cooperatives. So during the NAP, uh, in the beginning of the NAP, sorry, uh, the first 12 consumer cooperatives that were authorized. And here we are still in this orthodox vision of cooperatives as mostly consumer cooperatives. But very soon, uh, Lenin had rethought his vision of agriculture program for the party. And uh, we see that uh, already uh, in the beginning, in the end of his life, in 23, in the uh, very beginning of 33, he starts to rethink uh, the cooperation. And uh, just let's return to the agriculture uh, program of cooperatives. So uh, there are two main concurrent political projects for uh, villages. The first one is collectivization. That one you know quite well. That one of pulling together the land. And this is the main difference. And another one is less known that is of cooperative uh, concentration or cooperativization that is uh, thought to be only pulling together of capital. So it was not the land that was collectivized, but it was the, 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 the acquisitions. For example, uh, the agricultural producers, they buy together the uh, fertilizer, uh, agricultural tools, and then they sell together uh, their products. And as we see, normally, uh, the, uh, it was the collectivist program that was uh, dominant in the political line of the Bolshevik party. And we see in this table the first statutes of different associations of uh, agricultural workers. Uh, that were created before the NAP, they are those of pulling together the land. This is Komuna and Tavarshito uh, Poasadmiesne Abrabotki Zimbi. And uh, later in, in 1930, again, you know, there is the Kohos that is pulling together the land. And just before, 
during the lab, there is this, this strange thing that our uh, agriculture cooperatives that appear really like a parenthesis in the agriculture politics of Bolsheviks. And this is dictated by the way uh, the Lenin decided, Lenin decided to adapt uh, the political program uh, towards the villages in order to get the political support of the countryside. And uh, his article that he published, uh, that was published in May uh, 23, say, uh, actually uh, really has a, make, makes a, a crazy mix of uh, cooperative uh, parts of ideology with uh, the Bolshevik uh, political discourse. So the main argument of this article is that uh, cooperation is actually a step towards the socialism. And this is a very important turning point in the, politic, in, in the politics of Bolsheviks, because it is the first time the Bolsheviks use uh, the word cooperace in the legal text to refer to agricultural co uh, cooperatives that before they were just ignoring their existence. The, before the word cooperative was only used to say uh, consumer cooperative. And now, on the contrary, there's a, a radical term. Cooperative now means mostly agricultural co uh, cooperation. And uh, the, the difference of this conception from the original cooperative uh, program is that Cooperation is only a step before pulling the land together, before collectivization. And uh, this actually, this, this uh, instrumentalization has allowed to uh, justify the reappearance of cooperatives in the socialist uh, society. And uh, when Lenin died, uh, it was used by Stalin. Uh, to, even, uh, to, to, to fight against uh, his uh, political opponents. And the expression that uh, Stalin, or maybe other people that it was Stalin who was using it uh, too, the, the expression that was uh, invented is that of Lenin's cooperative plan that really has to mean uh, two different things, two very uh, contradictory things. First, uh, in the first phase of fighting left opposition, it meant uh, so it meant that uh, cooperation is building socialism, and uh, people who deny this are actually uh, denying the, the, the possibility of cooperation to, to be uh, useful. And on the second period, that one of fighting of right opposition from 27 to 30, uh, the same expression used, was used to uh, criticize those who want to maintain cooperatives and who want to, uh, who were criticizing the forced collectivization. And uh, this period of 24, 27 is really a golden age we could think at the first, like in the first glance, we can think that it's a golden age of cooperatives. But uh, actually, uh, it's not that shiny uh, as it seems. And uh, at that period, uh, we see reappearing and reproducing of all the infantilization uh, and inferiorization of rural uh, population and cooperatives appear again as it was already in the uh, cooperative uh, ideology and discourse before. Cooperative appear like a magic tool that will allow uh, agricultural producers to uh, ameliorate their uh, produce, production, production. But this time, the resources are very few and uh, the cooperatives that are created have actually no financial financial aid from the Soviets. So uh, 
in fact, this cooperatives among the, the ordinary people, they produce uh, a very strong feeling of deception and uh, the first uh, hopes that appear in the beginning of the lab, they are very uh, violently just broken and uh, cooperative, agricultural cooperatives become uh, a synonym of uh, deception. And very soon, uh, ordinary members start to use them in their own needs and uh, they autonomize themselves so they bring a distance between their interests and those that are uh, supervisor and imposing them. And just uh, you see here uh, another example of reproducing of this uh, infantilization. Uh, so on one side you have a, a view of the cooperative outside that reproduces the, the common image of a peasant and a man uh, with a bird or with a beer and uh, on the other side you have images that are auto representations and people here are depicted with dignity and they are uh, actually wearing city clothes so this representation allows uh, allow us to see the, the gap that uh, exists between the interest of supervisors that one to impose uh, a certain project on villages and the divergent interest of common uh, members that use cooperatives in, uh, for their own needs. And uh, the consumer cooperatives uh, also were uh, living the same kind of transformation. The propaganda was saying that uh, consumer cooperatives were selling good uh quality uh merchandise and the, uh, the propaganda such as for example uh, theatric theater scenes were showing cooperatives as morally superior to private enterprise but in fact the real experience of uh, common uh, urban dwellers was absolutely contrary Cooperative uh, as a shop has become a synonym of a bad shop where you can have nothing or where everything is expensive or uh, just a, a simple business that uses the name of the cooperative uh, to uh, become legal. So uh, in the case of consumer cooperatives, we see the same uh, process uh, as in the agricultural cooperatives. The propaganda was not meeting the uh, real experience of common members and this gap actually has created uh, anger among the, <coughs> anger and frustration among common cooperative members and when during the uh, break turn in 1930s cooperatives were closed or transformed actually there was no popular support to to it to against it uh, to, to cooperatives so there was actually uh, very little voices against it and uh in the in the end of the 20s in the end of the lap when uh there was a fight against the right opposition we can see as a shift a new shift towards the orthodoxy and uh, cooperative as a word that means agricultural cooperatives disappear at the same moment as the uh, co collectivization is decided. So you have no longer uh, the word cooperative in the legal document in le legislation since winter 29 because it is uh, replaced by consoles. On the contrary, uh, cooperative remains to mean something new so uh, there is actually a, a heritage of capitalism in the soviet uh, political vocabulary and uh, starting from 30s capitalism means actually an abstract uh, process of pulling together capital and land or capital and labor 
And in more concrete, more uh, narrow sense, cooperative means only consumer cooperatives and never agricultural cooperatives. So, uh, what we can see that uh, cooperatives as institutions were profoundly transformed by Bolsheviks. Uh, the cooperative discourse was uh, not totally destroyed, but it has been transformed. It was permeated by Bolshevik discourse. And the experience of ordinary members uh, have changed profoundly to become something like uh, a sin so that cooperative became a synonym of a bad experience, bad shock, bad enterprise. And uh, Cooperatives as institutions, though, they have a range. They have shown their flexibility, their capacity to adapt to different political uh, projects. And uh, they were not suppressed, but they were transformed and uh, digested in a kind of a sort of way. So uh, the cooperative ideology was used to justify the very opposite object uh, projects and uh that in 1917 was meant to design to 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 designate a very inclusive political project that one that you can see at the uh, first poster when we have uh, women and uh, people from different social and uh, different ethnicities, uh, ethnies. So this very inclusive project was transformed so it could justify on the contrary political violence. And uh, the second poster that we can see here illustrates the, the way how Cabrats is used to justify the, the elimination of certain uh, social groups. So uh, Cabrats in 1930 was used finally to justify its own suppression and the collectivization. And thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm very, I would be very happy to answer to your questions. Uh, Anna, thank you very much. Uh, uh, a good overview, I think, of the, your take on the Soviet period, the relationship with the state, the central state. Um, we have quite a few people in the online audience and well as people in the room. And the floor is open for anyone who has a question. Uh, you can do so by uh, writing into the chat or by raising your figurative hand. Uh, Anne O'Donnell. I have, Anna, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a small technical question, um, but one that uh, takes up a lot of space in the earlier period, the period after from 1917 to the onset of the new economic policy. I'm curious about the relationship between the cooperatives that you're describing and the more or less um, official consumer societies that were mounted, um, particularly by municipal governments. You mentioned that you know every village is forming a cooperative. In the large cities, of course, there were these, you know, Pakarabitsky Wobshis Club. Are those the same? Are those understood as cooperatives at the time? Um, I guess what I'm asking is, what was the relationship of the cooperatives to state enterprise and state ownership? Oh, uh, so uh, thank you for this uh, very important question on the relationship during the empire uh, period. That is actually. Uh, I mean, um, it is a, a very uh, difficult uh, subject to dig. And uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, paid attention totally at, at this topic. But I can say that uh, if we consider the relationship between uh, consumer uh, cooperatives and uh, the Zemstvo uh, enterprises that are not totally uh, municipal, but the Zemstvo. Yeah. The, the relationships uh, they vary from one locality to another. They yeah. can be ri rival on the personal uh, level because yeah. there are nobility against uh, not noble uh, people. 
And uh, for the other type of uh, inference, I cannot say yet, sorry. Um, you want to follow up? Uh, no, that's right. Veronique Miklish? Um, yeah, thank you very much. I had uh, a few questions, mostly on the 20s. Um, you know that cooperatives in 24, 27 were mostly agricultural cooperatives, but their weight in agricultural production was very high. Could you just specify what 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 they did, though? Like, to where were they actually somewhat involved in production? And then the second question, you mentioned the instrumentalization of Lenin's article on cooperatives uh, in the strong press against the left and then the right opposition. Was there, um, I mean, I've noticed that too. Do you think there was real content to it? Like, were there actually debating something real or not? Because I'm a bit, like, as you say, they, the cooperatives were not super important at the time. I don't think that the Soviet government undertook large scale efforts to promote them in that period. Um, but as you said, they, they did use this against the left opposition. And it was in, rela in relation to the, the debates about the peasant question, but again, was this more rhetorical, ideological thing to use Lenin against them? Or was there was there something to it? Yeah, those were my questions. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I have a uh... I have made an impression that uh, agriculture cooperatives were uh, more visible, but it is mostly because they were more visible in a political discourse. In a term of numbers, uh, I would say that it's quite uh, equal because because you can have consumer cooperatives that do absolutely the same thing as agriculture cooperatives at villages. It's only a question of uh, legal uh, statute. And what they're doing is uh, getting a credit to buy, for example, take, uh, I'll take an example of an agricultural cooperative that was created in 1924. This was called Tractor. And uh, at its creation, it uh, asks for credit because uh, this is uh, the, the, their reason to exist. And they ask uh, the central bank uh, for credit. The, the, the amount that they get is so small they can only finance a part of the defense of on a horse. So this kind of uh, activity that they were doing, and they were supposed to uh, promote a mechanization and uh, buying agricultural uh, machines. And uh, the, the agricultural cooperatives, they do not intervene in the production process. They only can finance uh, acquisition of a machine that allows to transform one of the parts of production producer for process. So this is the main difference from Colhoz that really is placed to work on the land, cooperative uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural cooperatives, they allow buy stuff and sell stuff. And uh, as for the instrumentalization of uh, cooperative in plant, uh, I would say, but uh, actually, I, I'm not that uh, specialist in the political uh, part of the history, the leaders, and uh, but at my uh, feeling, I would say that it was really a rhetorical tool uh, that was used uh, against the opponents uh, in the others, uh, different side, because actually Lenin had not told many things in his article. He has just said that Kopirace is good. And he didn't, he was not very precise in his article. And uh, this imprecision has allowed different ways of instrumentalization that uh, was resonating with divergent political projects. Um, sorry to read you a question now that came in over the, uh, yes. the text. It is from Camille. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting expose. My question regards the imperial period. I hope it is not inappropriate, but you cover the imperial period, so it's appropriate, yes. right? Did you come across significant political debate about Caparazia in the Duma? Was the cooperative movement even representative of the Duma? Oh, thank you for uh, this question. And uh, it is true that uh, cooperative leaders, they try to reach uh, the political debate on, on the upper level. 
And I know that uh, right now, I don't remember which one of four Dumas have uh, actually uh, almost uh, validated a text of the law that was proposed by cooperative leaders to authorize creation of companies with uh, no political control uh, prior to creation of companies. But I know that this law was finally not accepted. And uh, they actually, leaders of cooperative movement, they were trying to reach different deputies. And even in the fourth Duma, they were trying, but actually, the, the, the fourth, the most conservative Duma, was uh, the most. Uh, uh, against the, the cooperatives. So there is uh, also some, several cases where Duma, on the contrary, was trying to protect private enterprise because they were uh, claiming to be suppressed by the uh, unleal countries of cooperatives. Um, let me ask you something about the, uh, I mean, the two, two parts of which. The first part is about Lenin. And they, of course, the article you wrote was very famous. Um, and the, the article was, of course, as, as I recall, it was meant to be one of the ways of introducing happiness for a new economic policy. Meaning, this would be one aspect of how a new kind of trade relationship could be established in Russia, in the, the, the Russian Federation. Uh, that it would be, in other words, uh, uh, a way to teach peasants to be civilized in how they conduct themselves in trade, mm -hmm. first and foremost, right? processing and trade. And of course, it's very vague, right? What that might mean, but it's also in some ways quite specific. Uh, and maybe you want to speak about that also, which is to say, uh, I mean, when he says you know, to teach them to trade by Yevropinsky and Yepaziatsky, right? Uh, he's making a statement about how he considers peasant trade and production to be, uh, which is to say it's barbaric in certain ways. It's not civilized. Uh, and a cooperative sponsored by the state, because uh, they are sponsored by the state. Uh, the cooperative would teach them how to be a different kind of economic actor, which is worth pondering, I think, and I'm sure you have pondered it. Anyway, that's, so that's one set of questions. But related to that is another one, which is there's a certain continuity uh, from the imperial period to the uh, Soviet period, uh, not so much with trade with the consumer cooperatives, but with the, all the other cooperatives, which is they had some degree of official sponsorship, right? Very direct. Uh, so, you know, the credit cooperatives, as you know, were. Most of them were financed in one way or another by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, other ones were getting support from Bouzis, the Ministry of Agriculture. And in the second period, it also encompasses the consumer cooperatives. So they had some sort of official backing and funding in some cases. Uh, which means that for, uh, so, so one of the conversations coming particularly from the leadership of the cooperative movement, <clears throat> not only since at least the, you know, the NSA and you know, those groups of people, so for them, the, the cooperative is supposed to be independent of state power. Uh, on the other hand, there's the products of state power in both, in both periods, which makes for a different kind of conversation, which is, can you direct state power to help us in the ways that we'd like this to help us? More in the Soviet period, even in the imperial period. So there seems to be a paradox of some sort, which I'm sure you've thought about. Maybe you'd like to comment on. Okay, uh, thank you so much for these two, two points. And uh, as for civilization, the, the first question, uh, civilization uh, of peasants. That, I, I mean, I think I, I guess there are two two dimensions to, to this claim. First is just making peasants urban in their way of being, and uh, I guess that there is no special uh, idea of how do uh, villagers uh, make trade before because there is just a desire to make village urban. And as this discourse actually reproduces the cooperative discourse on consumer uh, and uh, cooperative uh, official consumer ideology that was uh, desiring to, to, to make the trade in a European style and the, 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 the department stores. The, they were like that one of Gun. That was actually the, the, the dream of the cooperative movement. They wanted to make that kind of corporate, uh, consumer cooperative everywhere, but it was actually possible in a 
countries with a high level of living in France or Belgium, there are worker companies that are, have actually bought a, a department stores, but in Russia it was never uh, the case. So it was rather a desire to, uh, to just to make a moral uh, and modern uh, type of uh, commerce, like really in, in this kind of representation of what is a, a modern uh, department or whatever uh, retail shop. And uh, as for uh, the, the relationship that cooperative uh, movement and its different branches has uh, towards their uh, relationship to the state, as a state as, as something that we can define as only money or uh, state as autocracy or state as a government where we have a political uh, the same political wings uh, so there, there are different uh, levels uh, and different periods in a way cooperative movement and different branches uh, refer to their uh, attitude to the state. And uh, there is a branch that is more anarchic of all that one of uh, worker cooperative that has always, even during the provisional government, when all other branches were saying that now we should work with the state, this branch was saying actually cooperatives should be always away, but it is the most marginal uh, branch that is almost uh, unknown uh, the, the 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 consumer cooperatives and they were uh, eager to make a political alliance with government and the agriculture co cooperatives were they were actually uh, part of the more large uh, social reform uh, group that uh, we can see actually uh, this kind of uh, representatives of these social reformers that are better known in the states under the name of progressives, we can uh, find this kind of uh, idea in other countries too, where the uh, the idea is that liberalism has uh, has done something that uh, creates uh, bad working conditions and creates proletarization, and it should be uh, avoided. So state should uh, finance uh, precisely uh, individual agricultures, uh, 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 small proprietors, so they stay on the land and they, they, they don't get proletarized, sorry. And uh, this progressive thinking was actually uh, uh, advocating for financing. Because yeah. it, it, it avoids fertilization. And in the Soviet period? In the Soviet period, uh, actually, companies were lacking uh, financial support. And their main concurrent were not private enterprise, but state enterprise. Because state enterprise had unlimited credit, and they could, uh, they could have better uh, produce at uh, and uh, unlimited uh, amount and cooperatives, they could uh, not meet their uh, requirements in uh, in any kind of purchase because they had not enough credit and they were always preceded by the Zagatovich, Zagatovich and other state uh, companies. Yeah, so the state procurement agencies. Yeah. So, so would it be fair to say that in the Soviet period, the main contribution of the Soviet state is to give the legislation which permits them to allow them to open, give them charters, but not so much in terms of bank credits. Exactly. So actually, uh, uh, the, the, the policy of fixed prices had actually made the cooperative, in Soviet period, cooperatives were, cooperatives were under, uh, they were in the red, they were always um, yeah, deficient, sure. deficient, thank you. Because actually they were buying agricultural produce and market prices, and they were forced to sell it to the state at a fixed price that is lower. So uh, in a structural way, companies were forced to be uh, deficient. Right, they, they, they go to deficit. Yes. 
Lost my game. That's interesting. And that's all the way through the 1940s, right? Yes, yes. And, and actually, they, they try to make through it and uh, it's another part of the story that uh, needs to be uh, studied in more detail. Well, you'll do this, right? Sorry? You'll do this. You're doing this, right? Oh, <laughs> I mean, uh, the financial, uh, I mean, uh, more financial detail is uh, sure it would be passionate to study the, the, the cooperative as businesses, but yeah. this is totally different story. I, I, my main focus is, is on cooperatives as uh, people that are working in. Do we have any more questions from the room or from the out there? Better need to do every hand up again. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe Please. then the follow up question: Did they have any kind of ideology then in the twenties? Because the what, what you described for the most part is that the state they integrated it to the, the cooperatives to some extent into how they ran agriculture. But nothing of what you said should suggest that there was like, you know, the kind of cooperative spirit, um, also even the passionate kind of involvement of peasants in them as to some extent, you know, that was the case before 1970. So yeah. is there some kind of ideology yeah. or? Actually, there is ideology, but there is no uh, cooperative dream. This is the word that they, uh, I've met in uh, archival sources. That there was an cooperative dream that was quite uh, strong, and uh, it had reappeared in the beginning of the lab, but very, very rapidly. Uh, people that were really believing that now they could restore the cooperative activity and function before they were deceived, and they just left uh, cooperatives. They went to another uh, sectors of uh, activity, and uh, I have several uh, evidence of people that were trying uh, in the very beginning of 20s, before 24, before 22, they were trying to, to leave their, uh, their dream of civilizing uh, peasants as they, the supervisor, for example, were doing before the revolution. And they were deceived because they were saying, uh, they were seeing that the cooperatives that were uh, now, that they were advocating for now, they're, actually uh, not that um, so they, they cannot provide any benefits for the peasants. So the, the Naroniki style uh, atos, uh, they actually left the supervisor uh, professional group quite early. And the people that had left were just the normal white collar uh, ex execution uh, obedient uh, workers that easily had uh, subscribed to the official discourse provided by the Soviets. Audience, thank you, Arna. I was really interesting and fascinating. I was wondering if the MTS, the machine the machine tractor stations of the Great Break, you know, were somehow a continuation of the agricultural cooperatives in the 1940s. Because you said that contrary to the Valkhozi, they were only buying tools. Or were the MTS completely different? Thank you, Maha, Maha uh, for your question. And uh, the MTS, they appear after the agricultural cooperative disappear. So uh, in a progressive way, since 1927, the function of buying uh, machines and providing machines to producers, these functions were taken from cooperatives to give them to new institutions. So in some way, in a function, in a kind of a function, MTS is a, 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 like a continuation of the mission that cooperatives were meant to do, but in a legal way, there is no uh, connection. Like there is no, as an enterprise, it's a totally different, uh, uh, right. yeah, the the MTS were state institutions through and through, right? Through yes. Through, yeah. Okay. I think we're all right then. Um, we can continue the conversations ourselves and online. Everyone is free, of course, to write to the speaker. Um, thank you very much for making the time to see us. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your time in New York. Uh, we're going to have another session in early May, uh, uh, which will be a uh, 
focus on the text which you'd like us to, to look at. That will be, you know, people will need to request the text in order to see it. Um, and in order to join the discussion online or in person. And as a commentator, we're going to have Yekaterina uh, Pravilova coming in from Princeton uh, to look it over to give you her comments directly. Right? So thank you again. Thank you also to the audience in person and virtual. And we'll see you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>